tonight's webinar uh, is hosted by Lanjis Michaud and Justine Sierji. Uh, Dr. Uh, Justine Sierji specializes in hard to fit contact lens patients, including regular cornea, post surgical, and dry eye disease. She graduated from Pacific University College of Optometry and is the Director of Optometry at Hunter Vision in Orlando, Florida. As an accomplished speaker, Dr. Sierji has given lectures and industry presentations across the United States and internationally on the fitting and management of contact lenses. She's an active member of the Central Florida Optometric Society and the American Academy of Optometry, amongst other professional associations, and has and volunteers her time as a board member of Central Florida Lighthouse. Dr. Sierji is a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society and the former fellowship chair. Our other presenter, Dr. Langis Michaud, graduated from the University of Montreal College of Optometry in 1986, where he also obtained his master's degree in physiological optics in 1998. Dr. Michaud is a full professor and practices at the University of Montreal. He's done so since 2001 as the chief of the contact lens department. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a diplomat. Uh, the British Contact Lens Association, the Scleral Lens Education Society, and the European Academy of Optometry and Optics. Dr. Michaud has published numerous articles in peer review journals and publications or professional reviews. He uh, is often to, uh, has often been invited to speak in Europe, Asia, and the United States. Finally, Dr. Michaud is the current president of the College of Optometrists of Quebec. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Michaud and we'll get started with the presentation. Thank you and uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar about uh, fitting complicated refractive errors and the use of the technology to aid uh, scleral contact lens fitting. We know how scleral lenses are amazing for those who are already fitting those lenses and for those who are interested to begin with, you will discover that very soon, but it's a game changer and certainly uh, we can make a difference and change the lives of our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. First of all, because uh, they are filled with fluid that cover the cornea and compensate for an irregularity on the cornea, we can restore very, very efficiently the vision of the patients uh, after a surgery, after a scar, scar after a trauma, um, keratoconus, any kind of you know irregularity on the cornea can be certainly compensated by the tear fluid layer, and on top of it, you know, the uh, perfect optics of a gas berm lens. Certainly, this is the one, one of the main advantages of several lenses. They were used in the past, mainly at the beginning, and certainly going on still, um, to treat ocular surface diseases. We know uh, how efficient they are to restore, you know, the ocular surface when you deal with a very, very dry eye and or a recurrent erosion and any kind of, you know, pathology, neurotrophic corneas, for example, um, that need a, this micro environment that is very unique to scleral lenses. And certainly uh, it provides a shield over the ocular surface, uh, alleviating any uh, bad effect of blinking process and exposure to air and to natural environment. So scleral lenses are certainly one good thing for that, and we 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 say we we appreciate those those benefits in the past for sure and for the future. Uh, I I believe in that. They provide an excellent comfort as well because they do not touch the cornea, they do not move a lot, so there's not there's no lid to lens interaction, and while they sinking in the conjunctiva. They, um, they are obviously really stable on the surface of the eye, so it helps a lot to provide excellent comfort. And if you compare small gas berm lenses to scleral lenses, and you take, you know, a, a patient that was fitted, you know, 20 years ago in small gas berm, you switch him in scleral lenses. Every time I did that, it's a wow effect. Uh, the patient cannot believe that you know he, he would he, he would be so comfortable in lenses compared to what he uh, used to be uh, before. Uh, as for the vision, uh, obviously we mentioned about you know the tear fluid layer, but the, the large optic zone of scleral lenses, because these are large lenses, they provide you with you know an eight millimeter to nine millimeter optic zone. This is very unique to any kind of corneal and contact lenses in the field. 
Let's say that you are dealing with a very large pupil, a very high myo patient with astigmatism. Um, that patient with six or seven millimeter pupil will complain about halos and glare and fluctuant vision if he is fitted in soft lenses. Why? Because the optic zone of a soft lens, the regular soft lens that you that you fit on everyday basis, disposable lenses, has six millimeter at the most. That's for the optic zone. If you include and uh, incorporate some toric, you know correction on top of it, you will reduce that, you know, optic zone diameter up to 4.5, 4.8 millimeter at the most. So every time you put that lens in front of a large pupil, uh, part of the lights is entering in, in, uh, in, in the pupil in a non-corrective, you know, area of the contact lens and halos and glare are coming out of that. If you put that patient in slower lenses with a very large optic zone um, diameter, then, you know, you resolve and you fix these issues, and it's a, immediately, you know, a benefit for that patient. It's a, it's a wow effect every time. They provide more stability uh, compared to other lenses, and for presbyopic patients, we'll talk about presbyopia a little bit later tonight, it's a main advantage, because every time a lens is moving, obviously the optical axis of the lens is not matching anymore the visual axis of the eye, and you create, again, halos and glare, and you create high-order aberrations that can disturb the vision and pollute the, pollute the vision, the visual equity that the patient may have. Um, in, in summary, to provide vision and comfort for many patients who would be unable to see and to be fitted otherwise. Next slide. This is the algorithm. I apologize for the um, busy slide you have in front of you. Um, if you ever want to have a, a copy of, of this graph, um, just email me under my name, langis.michaud at umontreal.ca, and uh, I'll be more than happy to provide you with a copy of that in PDF. But this is the algorithm we apply at University of Montreal for irregular corneas. If we deal with severe arthritis, for example, keratoconus, ectasia, post graft patient, dystrophies, and um, post surgery patient, you will see that our option number one for most of these conditions are certainly sclerals or mini sclerals. Nowadays, we just, you know, um, adopted the new terminology um, uh, at the Scleral Lens Education Society. We'll talk about scleral lenses in general, and we'll talk about scleral lens of a small diameter for those who are under 16 millimeter. But you know, for the moment, you know, that that graph was made a few few months ago. Um, but you know, still, you know, scleral and 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 of large diameter or smaller diameter are the favorite, you know, options for most of these irregular cornea patients, except for post-graft patients. If you look at that graph, um, post-graft patients who have cell count under 1,000 per millimeter square. Why? Because there are some major concern about oxygen permeability of uh, uh, scleral lens system on fragile corneas, and when endothelial cells are less than, you know, thousand per millimeter square, if the hypoxic stress is strong enough, then you, you may have some opacification, vascularization, and uh, adverse effect on, on graft patients. So we are, we are very cautious about that cell count before fitting a, a sterile lens. But otherwise, in general, it's a, it's a given. And certainly, uh, other options may exist. But, you know, in my practice at university, uh, it's my go-to lens, no question. Next slide. To the point that for regular corneas now, we, we see that trend in North America going forward uh, with more and more practitioners endorsing the uh, technology of several lenses to fit you know, regular, normal cornea patients. The high myopes, the uh, astigmat, high astigmat patient, the presbyopic patients I mentioned, and even hyperopia. Um, Obviously, again, if you look at option uh, one line, you know, the regular patient, minus two, 20 years old, coming to your office, will be fitted first with hydrogen, silicone hydrogen lenses. But as soon as you will complain about fluctuant vision and or discomfort at the end of the day, which still represent, you know, 30 to 40 percent of our practices. Um, before dropping out, we, we will have to offer him, you know, other options, and, and certainly sterile lenses uh, can, uh, you know, be that option too that will resolve and fix the issues 
related to the previous lens worn by, by this patient. If you have if you have a high myopia, as I mentioned, because of the optic zone, um, in my practice, you know, sterile lenses are becoming more and more go-to lenses as well. They provide comfort, excellent vision. Uh, they, they do not dehydrate. The vision remains stable during the, uh, all the day. And we, we can manage, you know, ocular dryness as well, marginal eye dryness. For those patients in self-contact lenses, that are complaining about discomfort at the end of the day, my understanding of that is obviously multifactorial, but you know, we can consider them as marginal dry eye patients and the contact lens is just another risk factor, another element that we bring in the equation, you know, on making the tear film even more unstable. And because of this instability of the tear film, this patient becomes symptomatic of eye dryness. But even despite the fact that, you know, this patient would be fitted or not fitted, the same gentleman would be um, would certainly face eye dryness later on in the process, 10 years, 12 years down the road, and we have to address that as well. But you know, mini sterile lenses and sterile lenses in general can certainly help you um, to resolve those issues because they, they they keep the surface moist. You know, because the tear fluid does not disappear during uh, all wearing hours, and certainly it helps to, to um, you know, keep the uh, ocular surface moist and wet, and certainly more comfortable for the patient. Astigmatism over three doctors, it's a given as well, and if you have a presbyopic patient with astigmatism, there are very few options in North America, in North America available to fit them in soft lenses. This, uh, frequent replacement lenses. So certainly um, in several lenses, there are multiple options nowadays um, that are available. Sterols can become certainly uh, a key factor to improve your success in presbyopic fitting. Next slide. But if we look at all the benefits provided by several lenses, we have to remember every time we consider them as an option for our patient that you know we have to adopt a risk-benefit approach. Is, it, is this the best option for that patient or do I have something safer to offer to this patient? Um, especially nowadays that we know that you know some issues may be related. I mentioned about the post-draft patients. There are some concerns about you know intraocular pressure, we just published a paper on that. Um, not not an absolute contraindication, but certainly um, one yellow flag that is raised and, and certainly that has to be considered you know, if you have a glaucoma patient, for example, or someone with already a high intraocular pressure. If you put a sterile lens on that gentleman and you face an IOP rise of 10 millimeter of mercury, it may not be the best thing despite all the other benefits that sterile lenses can provide to that patient. So at the end of the day, you have to ask that question, you know, is it the best option and my, are my benefits very high compared to the risk I, when I put that lens? Next slide. Once you have answered to that question, you have certainly to, to look at the uh, opportunities to develop your practice. Uh, we know that internet is there nowadays, soft lens wearers are buying their products elsewhere, they do not consult as often as they um, consulted in the past, and competition is certainly uh, very present in, in every day of our, uh, of our you know, professional practices, and we have to make a difference and we have to find a niche. Um, we have, we have to, to, to identify those patients who can benefit from sterile lenses without having the risk of impairing their, their, their ocular health over time. Um, those are, that are suffering in small gas perm lenses, those uh, cannot be fitted in custom soft lenses or hybrids. Presbyopic patients, again, and, and those complaining about astigmatism and, you know, fluxion vision are certainly, you know, uh, per target person to, to identify and to, to, to be introduced to that technology. With that, I will just leave the microphone to uh, my colleague Justine and then she will uh, talk about presbyopia. All right, so we're gonna kind of just talk about presbyopia. As Langis had mentioned, these are patients that are really well served in scleral lenses because there's a huge percentage of patients that are presbyopic and it's just getting bigger. And there are certainly some unmet needs of those presbyopic patients as far as vision and comfort. You know, we're still getting about one in six contact lens patients that are dropping out. And a, and a vast majority of these are presbyopic patients dropping out because of comfort 
and also become, because of vision. So things that we need to just consider when we're visiting on how to fit our presbyopic patients are what their visual needs, so what's important to them. The near world has changed a lot with different demands. The iPhones and, and the smartphones in particular are held so much closer now that we have more of a need for fine reading material than we did 20 years ago when people could just kind of see book and magazine and kind of like further away reading. So we have different needs than we used to. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the different kinds of optics. We're also gonna talk about the centration and stabilization of the lens. Because the scleral lens is very large, it sits quite centered on the eye and that's really great for, for simultaneous optics, which is a lot of the cases with um, scleral lens presbyopic designs. It can also mask any of those corneal irregularity and also help with marginal dry eye disease. So we need to just get to know our patients. That's really important. Um, whether that's a patient who is an accountant that works at the computer, you know, for hours, and that's the most important is the vision at the computer and like the up close fine reading, versus patients that say are are driving for a living and the distance is really really important to them. So there's different kinds of optics when it comes to scleral lens designs. So they can be center near or they can be center distance. In a scleral lens, we don't get translation. So we can't consider any of those translating designs like we do in, in GP bifocals um, because the lenses don't move. So they're either center near or center distance. And that depends a little bit about the pupil. Lighting is always gonna be important, especially using all of those different kinds of optics. So we need to consider what's most important, whether they, the distance vision is very important or the computer work is very important. And also consider you know, how big their pupils are and what their needs are. So an emergent presbyope, someone in their late 40s, is gonna have a, a lot less need or they won't need as strong of an effective ad. They might be okay in a center distance versus someone who is, is 65 or 70 years old, they're certainly gonna need more near reading power. So most scleral lens designs are center near, but there's a lot of different combinations. So this is a page out of this, uh, this new textbook, Contemporary Scleral Lenses Theory and Application, which is a great book, just very thorough. So there's a whole chapter about scleral lenses um, for normal and non-corneal diseases. And you can actually see it lists all of the different kinds. You can just see there's a whole, uh, all of these different types of brands. You can see some of them are center distance and some of them are center near. Um, the diameters can vary, the ad range can vary. And sometimes even the size of the ad can vary, which I'm going to go over in these designs. So, that, you know, there's two full pages of all of these different designs that are all a little um, different, kind of vary around. So here's just a couple of the designs. On the right there is a Blanchard design. It's a center near, but what you'll find is that the dominant eye has a smaller optic zone so that there's, uh, you can transition to the distance a little bit faster than you can with the near eyes. So that's just kind of asymmetric sizing of the same near uh, center near. You can also get combinations where you have a center near and a center distance and also kind of dual aspheric designs. Uh, this is a so clear multifocal design, which is a center near front and that aspheric allows for vision at all distances. In this particular design, you can actually change the ad power and then the size of that ad zone. So in these two designs here, looking up at the top, so the first one is a center zone of 2.25 millimeters and it's a three and a half millimeter ad so that's a or 3.5 diopter ad so that's a pretty high ad compared to this other one which is only a plus 1.88 and the ad zone's 1.5 millimeters so this one would probably see better at the distance but this lens here would probably get you better near vision so in addition to uh, making sure that those presbyopes uh making sure that we're figuring out what their best visual needs are Another important aspect of a scleral lens is that it can mask that astigmatism, especially on the cornea. So it, we don't fit a lot of patients anymore in soft lenses. We don't do a lot of spherical equivalent anymore because the vision is just not very sharp. So if you look at this example, this is a minus two, minus 75 at 180. That's simply corrected with a minus 225. So the, the 2020 line is, is legible, but it's not clear. And you see if we correct that astigmatism, vision is just a lot crisper and sharper. And when we correct that astigmatism, it really makes the system of, of that distance and near vision um, crisper and sharper. So we can get different kinds of changes. Multifocal lenses definitely have that gradation of power from far, from far to up close. 
as opposed to like a, a bifocal, which would just have two distinct powers. And there's also a play of the depth of focus. So how your, your pupil size works to kind of effectively reduce the need for accommodation. So if we look at some of these optics, we can see up at the top here, this is an uncorrected presbyope. So they can see kind of clearly at the distance and then the vision up close is gonna get progressively blurrier. This is a bifocal version. So this is a patient in, in a monovision, one eye for far away and one eye for up close. So you can kind of see that distance isn't so bad and the up close isn't so bad. And there's kind of quite a bit of blur in between. Whereas that multifocal is gonna give you kind of the most consistent kind of vision across, uh, across those optics. So I'm gonna uh, let Langis talk a little bit about depth of field and depth of focus here. Thanks, Justine, and, and certainly this is uh, one point that is not so uh, obvious for many practitioners because our optics, uh, you know, course uh, is probably far away from most of us. Um, very, very simply explained, the depth of field is the distance over which an object may be moved without causing a sharpness reduction beyond a certain tolerable amount. So you move an, a target in front of you from point A to point B without losing the clarity of that of that uh, of, of that element of that target. As soon as the target becomes out of focus, you're out of that depth of field. But you know, obviously, that the depth of field may vary with your refraction and we. May, we may vary with the distance of observation, but most importantly, uh, the, 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 the most important element is the pupil size. If the pupil becomes smaller, the depth of field becomes um, uh, higher and, and certainly larger. Um, to the contrary, the depth of focus is the um, corresponding you know, scenario on the retina it's the uh, distance in front and behind the focal point of the retina uh, over which the image may be focused without causing a reduction uh, of clarity and sharpness. So the, the same target you saw in the distance in the field is the depth of field, but in your eye, the distance where the, the target is seen clear between the point A and point B is called the depth of focus. And again, it's very, very dependent on the pupil size, and in, in fact, in that case, it's inversely proportional. The smaller the pupil is, the larger the depth of focus will be, and the larger the depth of focus will be, you know, you rely less on accommodation. So this is why in some designs, um, we did introduce those lenses to correct presbyopia as well. Next slide. This is um, another uh, graph of, uh, I just explained, so if you do the animation here, uh, just like a bit, you have different entrance of pupil and that defines the depth of focus. Smaller pupil, the depth of focus will be enlarged and the depth of field will be uh, large as well. And, and you rely less on accommodation. If you enlarge a pupil, then you reduce the depth of focus and the depth of field and you have to rely a little bit more on your, on your natural accommodation. It's just like a very comparable to the pinhole effect and we, we we get it very, very immediately when we compare that to pinhole. If you look to a pinhole, obviously, no matter what your refraction is, you'll see clearly at all distances. So the, the depth of focus acts exactly the same way. So if you put the lens designed with the depth of focus image uh, technology in front of your eye, you may, in fact, help to reduce the need to accommodate. And because of that, you need less high plus power to in, in the system, the optical system of the lens to see clearly at all distances. Uh, we know that there's one lens actually in the market in the United States, not in Canada, um, uh, designed with that kind of technology. There's another one that is coming um, uh, and certainly in hybrid and several lenses, we'll see that in the near future, but it's a very effective way to correct presbyopia, and if you consider that, it may also be uh, very useful to um, uh, to be used in children and to control myopia. There are very nice articles on the efficacy of those lenses on myopia control, and certainly it's worth the effort to talk to your manufacturers about that. Uh, next slide. 
no matter the design is, um, the, the most important point is certainly the, uh, the lens centration, as Justin explained. We have to match at the most the optical and the visual axis in order to, to, to be efficient in our presbyopic correction. And we know that with convergence, you know, that visual axis will be displaced nasally. And, and uh, to the contrary, the soft contact lenses will tend to be displaced temporarily. So when a presbyopic patient converge and is fitted with the regular, you know, presbyopic design that we have in our offices. Uh, most of the time the lens decenters a little bit more on, on one side and, and the pupil moves on the uh, opposite side. So obviously we lose a lot of efficacy out of that. And you can assess if you look at the right inside the topography, the, the topo map over there, this is a topo map taken over a contact lens, meaning that that the multifocal contact lens is still on the eye and you take the topography over it and you can see the rings and the uh, elevations in fact of the uh, plus you know rings and the positive you know uh, power of that lens and you see that from the pupil the black circle in the middle of the topography that lens is decentered actually and most of the plus lies outside of the pupil. So if that patient complained about um, bad vision at intermediate and near distance, you know upfront this is not because of the power, this is not because uh, of the refraction, but it's because the lens is decentered on that eye and the optical axis doesn't match uh, the visual axis when the vision is looking at near. This, even if you increase about the, the, the end power on that lens, if you do not change the design, if you do not decay it, dislocate the, um, uh, the visual, the optical axis of that lens, you know, it, it won't work. Some lamps can do that in several lenses. Some lamps can do that as well. Um, more and more, in fact, just to put the um, optical axis a little bit, to tweak it a little bit nasally in order to improve your um, your outcome. And and it's one thing that you can ask your manufacturer to do it if 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 it's available in their appropriate design. If it's not uh, available, then move to another design and select another lens that will match, uh, that will be a better match for, for, for that patient. Um, otherwise, you will create eye order aberrations and blur, and certainly the patient will certainly not be happy on that. So topography over contact lenses is a very, very good way to assess your uh, presbyopic fitting um, in soft lenses and uh, even in small gas and, and uh, you know, uh, several lenses as well. Next one. Another advantage of, uh, you know, putting your presbyopic patient in several lenses is to deal with that marginal eye dryness I just mentioned. Um, we know that with technology nowadays, with the computer usage and the iPhones and tablets that our patients are using for more than eight hours a day in average for most of them, um, their blinking process is reduced by, you know, uh, three times, you know, instead of blinking 15 times per minute, our patients looking at computer screens, iPhones and iPads are blinking probably five times per minute. So it's three times less compared to to their natural behavior. And if you don't blink, don't blink enough, you do not spread the tear film over the ocular surface. But more importantly, you do not stimulate the meibomian glands in the lids. And it's already published in the literature, some case reports showing that very young patients at 24, 25, or 26 years old um, are losing meibomian glands because the gland that is not stimulated just collapse over time uh, because there, there's no production um, and no stimulation of that gland. And it, that loss of marginal gland is irreversible. So um, if you do a mepography on, on these young patients using uh, a lot of uh, you know, computers and, and iPhones and tablets, um, you may be surprised to see you know, that kind of loss. And, and Obviously, the, the correspondence of that is the development of marginal and true eye dryness. Um, we have to address that. We have to monitor those conditions and we have to treat it aggressively. And with aging, uh, especially in presbyopic population, it's becoming worse and worse. If they have you know, dry eye when they are young, they will not be uh, fixed when they'll be over. And 
by aging, obviously, we know that the tear film becomes more unstable. And sterile lenses can help you uh, to, to provide, again, the um, unique environment to keep the eye moist and to alleviate dryness over, over the years. Next slide. In summary, multifocal contact lenses can, can cover all the visual needs you may have. Uh, you can correct up to uh, three and a half diameter of corneal astigmatism, not, not refractive astigmatism, but corneal astigmatism with a spherical lens, which is very unique. Uh, it certainly helps you to improve your, your score and your success rate in presbyopic fitting. The lens habitually is, is uh, centered if you, um, if you design your aptics carefully. I, I, I'm a big fan for presbyopic and normal cornea patients of you know, using smaller diameter uh, several lenses. Why? Because centration is way easier to, um, to achieve because we do not have to deal over 15 millimeter, 15.5. We don't deal with you know, conjunctival altericity to the exception of very, very few patients. So with regular spherical aptics, uh, we can have a lens that is really well centered and we don't have those issues of uh, uh, access not matching, uh, optically speaking. But if you deal with larger lenses, and that's very good if you're, if you're on that side uh, and you prefer to work with your large lenses, um, but be prepared to, to uh, design toric haptics and toric peripheries for most of your patients, up to 90, 95% percent of your patients based on the Visser study published um, two to three years ago uh, because conjunctival toricity is there and we'll, we'll address that later on and certainly that's the only way to, to um, recentrate and to have a good centration of that lens, of that feral lens over the ocular surface. Otherwise, if you do not deal with the conjunctival toricity with larger lenses, that lens by gravity will just slide down and temporal because the conjunctival, uh, the conjunctiva on the nasal quadrant is higher and flatter and the conjunctiva in the temporal side is, is uh, steeper but lower as well. So by gravity, the lens tends to slide down and because of the shape of the conjunctiva where nasal is higher and temporal lower, it slides also naturally on the temporal side uh, and, and you, be, you, you end up with a prismatic tear film layer under that lens that creates some visual issues as well, not to mention that you can touch a cornea on the nasal superior quadrant, the opposite of this disintegration. That's really not a good thing to have. Next one. And uh, that tear reservoir uh, I just mentioned, as I said, uh, alleviate eye dryness and compensate, but can create some problem in the case of lens disintegration. Justine will um, mention okay. a few words about the prolate and oblate designs. Okay, so, you know, when we talk about prolate and oblate, what we do is we're actually comparing things to like a perfectly spherical surface. So if you had a perfectly round sphere, it's actually going to have a spherical aberration or a Q value of zero. So the cornea is not perfectly spherical. We know it's actually flatter in the periphery than it is in the center. And that actually gives it a, you know, a, a spherical aberration uh, of a negative, a negative 0 0.25. And that's just a normal, uh, a normal regular shaped cornea. So that's going to induce some spherical aberration. That, uh, like the shape of the cornea is also added to the crystalline lens, which has a little bit of, uh, a little bit of spherical aberration, also a minus uh, 0 0.25 in younger people that goes away with time. So this is how some of the younger people will get more glare and halos is because they've got this crystalline lens that's also affecting with their corneas and their larger pupils. So a prolate surface is one that's flatter in the periphery and oblate surface is the opposite. So now we have a curve in the center that's flatter than the periphery. So this is not the normal shape of the cornea, but it is that what we do with a lot of laser surgery and grafts. So like if you think about someone who's had a high LASIK treatment, we've actually removed some of that tissue right in the center of their corneas. So there's that, it's actually flatter in the center even than it can be in the periphery. That's, that's an oblate shape. That has a positive Q value. So a normal prolate cornea is negative and an oblate surface is a positive. So theoretically, 
if we take a prolate cornea and we add to it an oblate contact lens, we actually get the positive and the negative counteracting each other, and we've compensated for that induced spherical aberration. This becomes more and more noticeable with patients that have higher refractive errors. So we talk about like how there's a really good place for scleral lenses in patients that are really high myopes um, and just really high refractive powers. That's because these patients experience more spherical aberration than lower powers do. So how an oblate scleral lens works is it's, it's, it almost follows the same shape. It has the same edge. It's gonna have the same mid periphery, but there's a reverse curve right across the center. And what that does is it reduces some excessive central clearance without changing the rest of the fit. So it's, it's in that central six to eight millimeters where we actually see that reduction um, or we see those reduced, reduced curves. And when you use a reverse geometry curve, you're also changing the shape of the tear layer. So typically you make the tear layer a little bit more minus powered, and that's gonna change the, the, the overall power of the system, because usually your, your system is your cornea plus the tear lens, plus the actual power of the contact lens. So clinical applications of these oblate designs, we can actually design these lenses because they change the shape of the tear layer to reduce the power of a minus lens. So if you think about looking through a really high minus lens, and on the right here, you have a picture that's a minus 25. The higher the power of the lens, a minus lens, makes everything look a little bit smaller. So when we are actually able to redesign these lenses, so instead of a minus 25, they can get focus on their retinas through a minus 18 or a minus 17, we're gonna effectively make the world bigger. So that's gonna make you know, the, the vision a little bit crisper and sharper because everything's a little bigger and easier to see. We also, with those oblate designs, are able to reduce those higher order aberrations, like a spherical aberration we were talking about Q value earlier. And all of those things that reducing the power and reducing the spherical aberration improves the presbyopic condition. So if we can create some magnification just from the power of the lens, we're gonna get a higher, we're gonna get a little bit more effective ad. So we're not gonna need as much ad power. We're, our patients are gonna be able to read a little bit better up close. And these are all things that we could accomplish with oblate designs. So I wanna kind of go through an example here. So this is a multifocal contact lens that's already you know, very well fit. So this is a scleral contact lens. The base curve is a 790. The diameter is 14.9, so it's a mini scleral lens. And this power is a minus 14. So that's a pretty high minus power. What we do when we try to use an oblate shape just to change the power is we over vault the cornea right in the center. And then we use those reverse curves to decrease that extra clearance that we created. So you end up with about the same central clearance and maybe a little bit more over the kind of the limbus. And that creates that extra minus shape in the tear layer. So in this, if this was our goal to reduce the minus power, um, this design has three different layers, three different levels of oblateness. So we can have a 70 micron, a 110, and also a 150 micron uh, reverse geometry or oblate shape. And the more reverse geometry you use, the more plus you're adding to the system. So plus two, plus four, and then plus six. So in this case, say we wanted to go for maximum benefit. So we over vaulted the cornea by 150 microns, which in this case is 0.3 millimeters steeper. So if we went from a 790 to a 760, we have to compensate the power with SAMFAP. So we end up with a higher minus power, minus 1550. Now, if we incorporate this oblate of 150, our central clearance is essentially the same. We added 150 and then we removed 150, but we are able to add this plus six power to this minus 1550. So the overall power here is actually only minus 950. So we went from a minus 14 and without changing the central, the effective central clearance, we ended up at a minus 950 by using an oblate power. So what's that that's done is it's effectively given us four and a half diopters of extra ad power. They're gonna see that up close, they're gonna see that at the distance, the world is gonna be a little bit bigger. And that's, that's always gonna help how well they use um, the multifocal. So the oblate design is so great to use anytime you use those multifocals because they just make everything a little bit bigger, especially the reading. So if you made a vision, uh, if you used a plus four diopter oblate difference, the image size is gonna be 1.17 bigger 
And if you go all the way to a plus six, it's 1.78% bigger. So that's just, that's making that size six font like a size eight. It's making things uh, easier to read because they're bigger. It's like a, taking that tablet and making, or your Kindle and making the, making the print bigger. Okay. So this is sig highly significant for high myopes and also presbyopic patients. So another benefit of just oblate designs is to increase the vault over the limbal area without affecting the central clearance. So on the right here is an example of a pellucid marginal degeneration patient. And these patients are tough because what you end up with is this inferior steepening, this crab claw appearance. So they end up being quite high inferior over the limbus area. So when you fit just a regular scleral lens, Sometimes to get enough clearance over this inferior part, you end up with a ton of additional overvault right across the center. So if you're able to use that oblate design, you basically fit this limbal area and then you measure how much extra you have in the center and then you use a reverse geometry there to kind of make that tier layer more even so that you don't have like 700 here and then 300 here. So it just kind of evens out that cornea a little bit more or evens out the tier layer, which helps uh, sharpen up the vision. So scleral lenses um, with high refractive errors can make the world bigger. And they also have those larger optic zones that Langes was speaking about earlier. So he kind of alluded this to this a little bit, but if you think about a younger patient who has a six millimeter pupil, the soft lens optic zone, a spherical, is gonna be at six millimeters and a soft toric lens is gonna be four and a half. So even, you know, when we have a, a six millimeter pupil and a four and a half millimeter optic zone, you're getting glare and halos, starbursts around the edges of lights and, and things that way. And that just gets worse when patients drive at nighttime or in even lower lighting settings. So scleral lenses are gonna have optic zones of eight to 10 or even bigger millimeter zones. So it's gonna actually encompass that whole pupil and then some, okay? So I wanna go over just a quick case that kind of summarizes a bunch of these different ideas. Um, this is a patient of mine, uh, GK. He's a 31 year old retinal specialist. So he came to me because he was complaining about glare and decreased vision while he was doing surgery. He said his lenses were moving too much. So I refracted him. He's a minus nine and a quarter, minus 75 at 95, and a minus 11.75, minus 75 at 180. Both eyes are 20-20, so high myope, low astigmatism. Got, he has good vision. He was currently wearing AccuView one day true eyes, and that's a spherical lens. 14.2. Uh, he was 20-20 out of both of those. I talked to him a little bit about toric lenses. He said he had tried it once and he thought the vision was worse, probably because it's pupil, because that makes those that optic zone even smaller. So when I took a look at that lens, I could really see that his optic zone was very close to where his pupil was. And that was even with like the lights, even like with the lights on pretty high, I could see how close that was. So I knew that during surgery, when he was in that dark room, it was really starting to interact. So the advantages for him were to go to a scleral lens for a larger optical zone to neutralize the little bit of corneal astigmatism that he has. So you can see his map's not irregular, but he does have a little bit of astigmatism. And if we correct that, the vision will be sharper. And I was also able to modify the geometry to change the overall power of the lens. So what I did is I trial fit him in a 14.9 diameter mini scleral lens. Uh, I did a 790 base curve in the right and a 780 base curve in the left. And both of those were pretty low powers in the trial, so minus two and minus 250. So the over refractions you can see here are quite large to get him to see well. Minus 825 over that minus two in the right and minus 1050 over that minus 250 in the left. And the vision was 2020. And as soon as I opened the phoropters, both the right and the left, he thought the vision was so sharp and clear. Because you get those lovely GP optics that make things just crisper than they do in a soft lens. It also, corrected that astigmatism. So he noticed that difference kind of right away. So the fit of these lenses, and this was only about 10 minutes after the lenses had been put in, was about 250 microns centrally, cleared over the limbus and it had good edges. The left one was 300, cleared over the limbus with good edges. So overall, that right one was pretty ideal as far as fit. Uh, the left one, I could have flattened just a base curve. So I could have just stopped at 790 in both eyes and just added that vertex power but I went to an extra step. So in this design, when you go from a 14.9 to a 15.2, so a larger diameter, you actually create vault. So I created 150 microns of vault that way. 
So I kept the base curve 790, but by going to 15.2, I over vaulted the cornea by 150. And then I incorporated, this is the uh, central clearance reduction, which is this design's name for oblate. So then I did a 150 micron oblate value. And overall, I saw a reduction in power. It actually reduced the power all the way down to minus 350 in the right and minus uh, 525 in the left. So that was a huge difference compared to looking at a lens that was going to be a minus 10 or a minus 11. And he actually ended up 2015 in both eyes and 2010 with both eyes open. So really, really sharp, really crisp vision, was really happy with the overall effect that way. So I'm going to switch over to Longis where we can go over um, one of these last sections here about astigmatism and lens flexure. Yeah, uh, this is probably one of the most frustrating factor I ever figured with several lenses. You have this uh, keratoconus patient or even regular, you know, normal cornea patients fitted in soft lenses or gas perm lenses, but let's say in gas perm, small gas perm lenses. Kind of, you know, perfect vision with no real yeah, residual astigmatism. You kind of in sim about, you know, trying star lenses. Comfort's good, fitting is good, you know, your best shot ever for that kind of cornea. And you see the patient back, you know, in several, you know, days later on the follow-up, and he complains about, you know, halos, glare, you know, kind of disturbed vision. And you think about, you know, uh, symptoms really, really similar to uncorrected astigmatism. Um, where does it come from? Astigmatism comes from the cornea itself, the front surface of the cornea or the back surface of the cornea. In, in, in case of keratoconus, um, the problem with several lenses is that you compensate so well the anterior, you know, corneal astigmatism with the tear layer fluid that it leaves the back surface of the cornea irregularity to show up, you know, um, optically speaking, and it, it can disturb the vision. So it, it really, it's really there, and we have to take that in account, um, especially on, on those very irregular corneas. We can have lenticular astigmatism coming from the crystalline lens. If you compensate 100% your cornea, um, you still may have some, you know, uh, counter axis or against the rule astigmatism coming from the, the, the crystalline lens, and there's no way you will compensate that just with the fluid layer, obviously, because it's not in front of the cornea. So frontal external lenses can, are the only way to address that. And residual astigmatism uh, were taught was thought to be due to um, lens flexure, um, and, and the question is, is this real? And we look at that at university. Um, next slide, please. And we did a study to see if that, you know, induced astigmatism is coming from the flexure or for other causes like the TRL, you know, profile that may be non-uniform and, and or displaced, so certainly if the lens is dislocated in or if the cornea is not so regular. Next one. So we did a study um, with, with uh, our students. Lens were fitted with the SMAP 3D. We'll mention that uh, a little bit later on uh, on contractile profile. But, you know, for those who are not familiar with that machine, it's a profilometer, meaning that it's a topographer that, you know, that takes the cornea and the conjunctiva, and you can design a lens out of that. It's very well aligned in every quadrant, so you have a perfect match because you you were just mapping and and, and stitching the, your your photos, um, and the, the software design and building in the machine helps you to design a perfect lens that is aligned in every quadrant. So there's no way that lens will be unstable despite any kind of irregularity on the conjunctival surface. It's a perfect match, just like a globe uh, on your end. And, and uh, we did uh, that that particular design for that reason, and we varied the thickness and the clearance of, of several lenses on the same uh, population of patients. And you had the data here, very low myopes with no um, refractive cylinder, half a diopter, not that much, regular corneas, and with very, very good visual equity. Next one. 
so um, our our targeted you know measure for uh, the four lenses we use were um, thicker and thinner lenses fitted with low and high clearance. So on the side of the high uh, the the thicker lenses we targeted you know 350 microns and uh, around the uh, 250 microns for the thinner lenses. For the clearance, we fitted with you know 100 microns uh, as a thinnest point and uh, 225, 240 for the higher clearance. And all of these measurements were you know uh, evaluated under OCT just to make sure that we had the right numbers. So if you look at the next slide, you will see uh, the results. And there's there was not a lot of you know residual cylinder and residual astigmatism that we found um, varying you know the lens thickness and or the clearance. At the end, there was no statistical difference. So and the conclusion is that next one please is that no matter what you're fitting thin or thicker lenses with low or high clearance there's no variation in the residual astigmatism so lens flexure is not in play because thin lenses do not induce more in residual astigmatism compared to thick lenses and if you fit with thinner clearance you will not induce more residual astigmatism compared to thicker clearance. So, remove from your mindset that you know flexure is one cause of residual astigmatism. So, next one, what is it then? Uh, several hypotheses were were uh, uh, suggested. First thing first, um, Stephanie Ramdas from. Um, uh, Michigan uh, and with, with a group of Craig Norman suggested that lens eccentration create a prismatic tear layer profile that may induce halos and glare because of the irregularity of that tear film uh, surface and, and, and they, they made a study on that at Michigan and they proved that. The second hypothesis is that um, next slide um, and I think that it's it's really the good one uh, this one this intuition plays a role but if in our case you know lens were perfectly centered because they were aligned in every quadrant but the induced high order aberration especially coma is probably the cause of that residual astigmatism why because the best way that we have in our end except to correct for uh, you know uh, topo guided front surface uh, contact lenses but refractively speaking how we can compensate for coma vertical coma is to put you know toric you know uh, against the rule toricity in our foropter and to, to compensate for horizontal coma uh, it, it's you know with the rule of stigmatism with the rule you know tarik powers that can help us to to reshape that image a little bit more. It's not perfect, but it's better, and it reduces the coma. So when you over refract your um, uh, sclerotic lens patient with uh, some residual stigmatism, think about doing an aberrometry if it's available in your office because you will find those comas instead of, of any kind of real astigmatism. So as for the troubleshooting, next slide, uh, uh, we, we have to consider that if it's a lenticular astigmatism, as I said, coming from the crystalline lens, a front direct lens will give you a very, very sharp vision. If the lens is decentered and you have a prismatic tear fluid layer, you have to, to deal with that and recenter the lens. You reduce the lens size, reduce the mass of the lens, and or keep the same diameter but you know rely on toric peripheral curves to recenter that lens. Um, increase the optic zone, use the oblate design and I just talked to Joe Barr the other day about that and he mentioned to me that he had a master's student many many years ago looking at, at that kind of thing. It's happening also in small gas berm lenses and that student compared regular gas berm lenses for keratoconus uh, patients uh, compared to orthocalic 
lenses fitted on the same corneas, and what he found is that ortho -K lenses, so oblate design lenses in that case, reduced by half the coma and the eye order aberrations, uh, the residual ones that were kept with the regular gas perm lenses. So we do not reinvent the wheel here. It's exactly the same thing. So the non-uniform care profile bring eye order aberration, the surface of the lens, the irregular surface of the lens, especially the back and the posterior surface of the cornea will generate high order aberration that cannot be compensated easily except to have, you know, wave front guided, you know, correction and front of the of the surveillances, and I know that Houston University and Reapplegate are working on that. There are also some commercial lenses that are really, really, really near to to, to reach a market. Uh, prototypes are there, but for the moment, the only thing that we can do on that is to use oblate designs and or to use frontoric lenses. But lens thickness, the, the only thing that you don't have to do, and don't do that, please, is to increase the lens thickness. Because if you increase the lens thickness, next slide you will impact the oxygen delivery to the cornea. And I know that it's a hot topic and a, a debate in, in uh, around the discovery lenses, just like global warming, but I'm the polar bear side, and, and certainly I believe, really believe in, in oxygen and hypoxic stress uh, that we can put on cornea. So if you increase the lens thickness too much, you will just, you know, harm the, the cornea. It's not the way to go. So with that, I will leave the, the, the microphone to Justine to talk about, you know, those mapping systems. Sure. It looks like we just have a couple of minutes here, so I'll just kind of get through an explanation on, on what this corneal, um, this, this uh, scleral mapping kind of looks like. So uh, Longis alluded to this earlier. This is the SMAP 3, 3D topographer. So this is actually a fluorescein-based light structure topographer and it actually takes elevation of the cornea up to 22 millimeters. So you're actually gonna get measurements kind of even underneath the eyelid because you have the patient move up and down and you're able to kind of generate this million measurement points to within a 10 millimeter micron precision. So how this works is there's in, in the machine itself, there's a projector and then there's two cameras. So between those three, the two cameras and the light source, you get a, um, three independent triangulations where you can figure out how high all of these points and stuff on the cornea are. So you put some fluorescein into the eye, you have the patient look up, then you have them look straight ahead, and then you also have them look down. And then the computer takes those three images and it stitches them together to give you that 22 millimeter view. So you end up with these different patterns of scleral tericity. And scleral tericity does not always match up with the tericity that, that we're seeing on the cornea. So just because you have with the rule corneal astigmatism doesn't mean that you're going to have with the rule uh, scleral astigmatism. So when we actually look at the sclera itself, there's different patterns that we can that start to emerge that are similar to what we would see on the cornea, um, just as far as the patterns go. So with the rule sclera means that it's actually flatter, superior and inferior, and it's actually steeper nasal and temporal. So if you had a spherical lens on this eye, what you would likely notice is some impingement maybe, nasal and temporal, and not seeing impingement superior and inferior. So you kind of need to flatten where it's, uh, where you kind of get a steeper curve or change those curve to match, to match with that sclera. Against the rule is just the opposite. So it's flatter nasal and temporal, and it's steeper superior and inferior. And then the oblate designs, obviously we're just gonna kind of see those those in-between axes between the with the rule and the against the rule portions here. And there are also some patterns when we kind of take a look. So when we look at this, this is just the different scleral lens shapes. There's the spherical scleras, which is a fairly low percentage of patients that um, in this study that were measured. There's also regular tericity. So that's the with the rule and against the rule and the oblate that we just spoke about. And then there's kind of this grouping of patients that have high and low points, and it's just not a super even uh, scleral mapping. It might be patients with blebs or conjunctival obstructions or anything like that. So there's just lots of different shapes when we look at the sclera. And this, these different imaging systems just are allowing us to kind of learn more about that shape so we can fit these lenses more effectively. So I think kind of with that, because we're just running a little bit out of time, we respect everybody's time here, we're gonna move on to some kind of questions 
uh, at the end here. All right, thank you both for that uh, wonderful presentation. I think we just have time kind of for one question today, and uh, it deals with uh, your thoughts on multifocal square lenses over keratoconic or regular corneas and, and the efficiency of that. Yeah, um, I can take that question. Uh, I, I, I'm fitting uh, proactively my keratoconus patients as, uh, as well as my regular patients with multifocal lenses. Yes, you can do it. Uh, it's a little bit complicated for a keratoconus patient because I, what I just mentioned, the posterior cornea that can, you know, drive some fuzzy images. Uh, obviously, if you put a multifocal, you know, device on top of that, uh, it may really be not as good as you may want. Uh, so some keratoconus patients were not able to get used to that kind of vision because of the um, halo flare and all that stuff, despite everything we, we tried to do, it, it was it was a, a nightmare, and we remained with spherical lenses for distance and, and uh, reading glasses for those patients. But in, in the majority of cases, I, I have to confess that, you know, it's not only um, easy to do, but, you know, it's worth the effort because those keratoconus patients and obviously normal patients will appreciate a lot to do not have to rely on, on, on uh, reading glasses for, for every task they have to accomplish at near distance. And I promise them um, always the same thing. It's my 90 rule. 90% of your visual needs, 90% of the time will be taken care of by, by with the lenses. Uh, and 10% of, of your visual needs, 10% of the, of the time, you will still need some reading glasses. And obviously, when you set the expectation at that level, you can deliver quite easily. Um, with, with the multifocal lenses that we have nowadays. I have a, a little bit of a different, I just, I'll, I'll throw in just a quick, quick comment here, a little different experience than Launches. I haven't been as successful personally with the keratoconic patients and the multifocal designs. I think it's just a lot of, uh, a lot of my keratoconic patients tend to have a ton of higher order aberrations. So I found that, that what I've been successful with in my practice is fitting them in spheres first. And if they get good acuity and they get pretty crisp vision in in the spherical designs, then I'll try a multifocal design. But I don't often start off just with a multifocal design because I want to make sure that they they have successful enough optics or they're they're going to get good enough um, visual quality even just out of a sphere before we add on that extra multifocal. Well, thank yeah, you. Uh, I agree with that. You know, one step one step at a time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you both so much. We're going to wrap it up there. Uh, everyone have a great evening, and we will see you next time. Thank you.